OK, hello everybody. Thanks Radcon for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. In the coming 30 minutes, I will walk you through the practice of pediatric radiology. So what we do, uh, we provide diagnostic imaging to pediatric population. Indeed, at IWK, we are children and women imaging, so we also provide uh, imaging modalities for preconception period, um, usually up to the age of 16 years, sometimes up to 19, depends on the situation and the uh, case. Uh, we use all type of imaging modalities in our practice. We use uh, plain radio, radiographs, uh, fluoroscopy, CT, MR, nuclear imaging with uh, radioactive materials and all types of ultrasound. Uh, in addition to the diagnostic imaging, we provide interventional uh, services that, that include diagnostic and therapeutic procedures to children. These are selected images uh, from fetal ultrasound and MRI. Uh, this is the early gestation with a tiny, tiny fetal pole here that does not um, have a cardiac beat yet. Uh, this is a more advanced pregnancy. The fetus now is 5 centimeter in length and measures approximately 11 weeks. Um, you can start seeing the, uh, the head and the limbs and a little bit of body. Here we have two happy campers, each one's uh, enjoying a separate sack. And this is a more advanced twin pregnancy uh, on a fetal MRI. You can see good details in fetal ultrasound. You can appreciate the lens of the eyes, the two nasal bones, the details of the hands and fingers and the phalanges. And some babies can pose also <laughs> to ultrasound. We can sometimes do 3D uh, imaging, usually for the fetal profile, sometimes for body parts, including this lower limb. Uh, you can see the thigh, the knee, the leg, ankle and foot. This is unfortunate baby that has a, a cleft uh, lip. Uh, the 3D here does increase the um, accuracy and confidence in making this diagnosis. So what's in general the difference between PEDS and adult practice? I think you will guess that once you step in a pediatric hospital, you will see the pediatric friendly environment with colored walls. Everything is very colorful, uh, very friendly. Um, you can see lots of uh, play rooms and uh, areas. Uh, you'll step into rewards, stickers, toys, and popsicles everywhere in the departments. These are selected images from our department. Lots of coloring, uh, color painting of the walls and uh, popsicles, of course. In our department, each suite um, embraces a different theme. So this is, for example, the CT with water and under uh, water um, theme with lots of fishes and sea. Uh, this is the space shuttle theme in the new MRI, the waiting area and the uh, MRI suite itself. And this is the jungle theme in our stick CT room. Uh, the kids will hop into those the rocks, they'll uh, finally jump into the table. We try these colorful walls and um, uh, distraction methods in order to keep them engaged and um, still during the examination as much as we could. So in general, the workflow in pediatric radiology department or practice is much slower than that in adults uh, because the exams are longer. The preparation for the exam will take longer before and after the image itself. So the volume commonly less quantity wise, but definitely not quality. Indeed, the quality of interpreting pediatric images are usually more demanding due to the variation in age and uh, different appearance uh, with different age groups. So we have a specific preparation for our pediatric population that you, you will never see that in other practice. For example, the feed and sleep technique, which we usually follow for the, those below the age of three months. Uh, sometimes we try uh, for the baby to skip the feed and then they come hungry and exhausted to MRI or CT. The mom or the nurse will feed them with a bottle and then um, swaddle and cuddle and uh, rock to sleep. And we will wait and wait till they are happy and even sleep and we'll try to put them on the table for CT and MRI and get that image before they wake up. Sometimes we use the help of the child life support service uh, to give some comfort and relaxation techniques to toddlers and preschool age uh, patients. Um, that's why our te uh, technicians, they usually have to wait till the kids is comfortable enough to go through the scan in order to avoid motion and uh, repetition of the image. Um, in some patient population, some age group, we can do that without the sedation and GA, and this needs a help of pre-procedural or pre-sedation preparation and then post-anesthesia recovery. That's why the flow and the volume is usually low. 
recently we used the advantage of the MRI simulator, which uh, the students in the Faculty of Engineering of Dalhousie, um, uh, thankfully they um, provided to us, they built it for us. So um, the thing is, this is our actual MRI machine, and this is the simulator, the fake MRI that the students built for us, and we put it in our waiting machine. So the kids, especially um, school age kids and toddlers or preschoolers, they can come into that and they try it, and there's an iPad connected to that that will simulate the noise that goes inside the MRI. So this helps the anxiety, decrease the anxiety, and increase the comfort level of them. We noticed that we, we tried actually to avoid some sedation with uh, these patients' population, which is a very helpful experience so far. Also, the modality choices is affected uh, by the fact that you are working in a pediatric department, right? So usually we are more vigilant to the radiation effect uh, on pediatric population. And thus we try our best to avoid CTs and to avoid uh, long fluoroscopy procedures. Uh, for example, in appendicitis, 90% uh, of those we do ultrasound and we repeat the ultrasound. We sometimes do MRI. And then finally, if we couldn't see it, we do a CT or in specific um, indications. Uh, this is in contrary to the practice in adults, which it's very hard to see the appendix on ultrasound, and usually they do go straight forward to CT. Right? We also try to find the shorter examination, the less invasive one that give us the diagnostic clue without much anxiety and discomfort to the kids. The idea is we try to avoid sedation as much as we could, especially in those patients that are uh, frequent flyers and having chronic diseases that needs multiple imaging uh, down the road. Pediatric practice is also unique that specific examination similar to the head and spine ultrasound, you can only do it in PEDS. And that's because of the fact of the ossification um, uh, um, development of those patients, right? So this is the spine ultrasound. Uh, we can do that up to the age of four months, sometimes six months, uh, as long as the posterior um, uh, ossific uh, ossification centers are not very ossified yet or posterior elements are not ossified yet. So the baby is in prone position, the ultrasound is held on the back, and we can see good details. You see the posterior elements, you see the vertebral bodies, the spinal canal in between, codiquine nerve roots, and the corner spindularis. Similarly, we use um, the head probe, the small baby probe to use to do head ultrasound in neonatal babies. And this is a very frequent daily uh, practice in pediatric uh, uh, departments to do head ultrasound in neonates and preterm babies. Um, we have the advantage of the open uh, fontanel, which gives us a very good acoustic window. We lose this as the, as the fontanel closed. We sometimes tell, can we do the TCD on the temporal one, but with different indications, right? The tools also differ according to the age. So this is the normal head coil, and this is the baby or neonatal head coil, which very different in size. Uh, some pediatric patients have like uh, the problem of hydrocephalus and they have shunts. These could present several times to emergency with features of shunt malfunction. These patients need frequent imaging to assess the size of the ventricle and to make sure that there is no active hydrocephalus. Uh, we, uh, we, we are doing limited MRI for those. We call it HydroScan, which is peculiar. Uh, and you are all usually you see it in pediatric departments, not much in adults. Um, it's a single shot fast spin echo sequence that uh, takes only a few seconds for each uh, acquisition to do it. We do that without sedation. We tolerate a little bit of motion on both. Uh, there is a limited resolution of the parenchyma inherited in the low resolution scan, but it's still diagnostic enough to give us a good clue whether the ventricle has increased in size or not and uh, location of the shunt and the valve. So apparently we are dealing with a large range of age groups in our practice, so, uh, ranging from preterm babies, few grams in weight, and uh, very tiny babies, very delicate. Um, these babies could be 24, 25 weeks in uh, gestation. Uh, we deal with infant, toddlers, and their tantrums. You all really see that, and their building personalities, especially in ultrasound, preschool age, schoolers, um, and uh, teenagers. 
right? And there is usually the third party comes into discussion, which could be the parents, could be the caregiver. You discuss that, um, the, the disease, the finding, the next step in imaging and the procedure. You have to explain this to the third party and sometimes you just explain to them that you're minors or teenagers. Uh, one additional variation is the rapid development. Uh, it's very uh, interesting how each day counts in these patients and each week counts in their imaging. Right? So the uh, sequential images of uh, fetal MRI, uh, neonatal MRI, sorry, and this is, um, for example, at 25 weeks of gestation uh, of age. Uh, so you can see how smooth the brain is, the interhemispheric fissure and cerebral fissure and the central sulcus. And then 33 weeks, there is more gyration and sulcation, 38 weeks, uh, almost um, close to the adult gyration and sulcation pattern. So it's very crucial for when you are interpreting, for example, uh, neonatal brain MRI to know what is the age of the patient because at 30 five weeks of gestation and you see smooth brain, this is totally abnormal, but it's totally normal if it's 25, 24 weeks. <clears throat> this is an example from literature following the corpus callosum development. So you can see it will formed uh, at one month of age and at birth, but then as uh, the patient progress, um, there is more thickening of bulky increase, bulkiness of the corpus callosum and further myelination increased white uh, signal intensity, right, with you one. The diseases we encounter in pediatric radiology is very different from adults. Uh, you will see lots of congenital malformation, metabolic diseases, growth related changes, uh, normal variants. So you have to be vigilant to those to know not to call it a fracture if it's just an ossification center or an accessory bone or something like that. Right? Their tumors are different. They have a specific entities that you might not see in adults and the prognosis is usually different. For example, this is a congenital teratoma in, the, in one and day old baby uh, that you will not see it in adult, right? And this is massive hydrocephalus associated with it. This is another example of a one day old that presented with a hemorrhage on um, this left um, temporal region. And then on follow up images, we discovered that the hemorrhage was into a tumor. So it wasn't just a, a parenchymal hemorrhage. And that hemorrhage on histology turned to be, uh, that tumor on histology turned to be a GPM. So a congenital GPM. Uh, luckily, congenital GPM has much, much uh, better prognosis than other GPM. This baby, this patient is now almost five years old and she's almost developing normally. Still alive. So what to expect? You will expect lots of crying, definitely, noise, screaming, tantrums, and depends, and depends on the day and depends on the study and the exam. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you'll see a lot of nice smiles, uh, giggles and laughs, and you will hear lovely chats with them about all types of uh, TV shows, about their siblings, about their uh, pets and friends and stickers. Uh, so it's very, very fun to work in pediatric radiology. The key thing to remember, kids are not little adults, they are so different. So how our days looks like? We usually our days are divided between clinical works, reporting, doing, performing the examinations, uh, teaching, undergrad, graduate, and sometimes postgrad uh, students. Uh, we do lots of research, and some of us are um, involved in administrative works. From research perspective. Um, the expectation is um, the sample size in uh, pediatric uh, research and uh, cohorts is usually lower than adults and usually stratified according to the age group, right? So even if you have the same research question, you can apply, apply it to different age groups um, because they have different um, prognosis, different uh, disease entities that could be specific to that age and different development pattern. Um, the limitation in uh, pediatric research is that usually you will see limited literature compared to the adults, especially in rare disease entities. But still, you can do any type of research in pediatric radiology. So, for example, you can do case reports, simple. And uh, this could be from your daily work. So, this is a, a teenager who presented for a follow up for a BB shunt and just got a, 
um, hydro scan to assess the ventricle size. And when we were looking, we discovered that this is a normal vermis in here, and this is another vermis here. So this person has a double duplicated vermis, and this is a unique anomaly, which we ended up reporting it and um, uh, publishing it in clinical case conference, as a clinical case conference. You can also do audit, which is considered a QA, QC type of um, research um, involvement. Uh, this is one that I did in my previous institution at SickKids uh, when I joined my fellowship. So what I did, I did search our search engine for the last three months uh, for those uh, kids who presented to emergency with abdominal pain and required abdominal ultrasound to rule out appendicitis. It turned to be 206 kids. Um, I divided them and those in the scan during the daytime and those after hours, and then how many in those we could see the appendix, how many we could not, and then what happened to each group, how many ended up with uh, sending to OR, how many discharged, how many we repeat the ultrasound or do the CTs, how many we were right, how many we were wrong. So we, with this, we gauge our practice and we know our sensitivity and specificity, which affect our QA. We, uh, I ended up publishing this as a poster presentation uh, and um, presenting this as a poster in the International Pediatric Radiology. And I was lucky to be awarded the American Academy of Pediatric Award for this uh, outstanding uh, scientific poster presentation. This presentation was also um, uh, published as an original article in uh, Emergency Journal. Uh, so out of the same data, which could be a simple collection of data that is already existed in the system, you can do many. You can do QA audit, you can do poster, you can do a publication from that, and uh, you can still do much more. You can do other retrospective studies. So we were involved with our neonatology colleagues in uh, population-based studies and um, to assess the epidemiology of neonatal stroke, for example, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and this uh, ended up presented several times as a scientific oral and poster presentations and uh, finally published too. Um, we did a retrospective study for hepatic artery uh, parameters and we established the normal reference data for those in liver transplant and what's the significance of the values um, to assess the graft function, which was very valuable information that was lacking in pediatric literature. You can take the extra step and do something more, but do prospective study, right? And this is usually more demanding, more time consuming, and uh, needs more commitment, but more rewarding. Uh, this is a study that I performed also during my fellowship. Uh, so what we did, um, all kids with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, who were coming to do MRE, magnetic resonance enterography, uh, were approached and um, we did uh, prospectively the ultrasound in the same day of the MRE, and then we compared the ultrasound findings with the MRE. So here you can see the nice bowel thickening through the um, transverse colon, and then the proximal and post stenotic dilatation. You can see the same thing on MRI. Then we established our uh, correlation between the ultrasound and MRE findings. This was a well-received study that uh, was awarded the Trainee Research Prize in RSNE. I presented it as an oral scientific presentation, and this is a very reputable um, um, award for trainee. And also, we published this in the American Journal of Radiology as an original article. Sometimes you can do uh, simple things like educational exhibit. Uh, last year with the COVID lockdown, not much to do. I did lots of um, educational exhibits and submitted them to ARS. Uh, this is one of them that is accepted for uh, next May. Uh, these could be based on something, area that you are interested to know more, or area that you find um, uh, you collect a good uh, collection of imaging, whether normal or abnormal, and uh, or something that you can just um, put it together as a presentation. Uh, so this is, for example, the Hodgkin's lymphoma one. It was a lunch and learn uh, presentation to our oncology and radiology colleagues. And then we established the guidelines and the appropriate CT report. And then I decided to put it as an educational exhibit together as a self-learning module, which was a good uh, thing to do. 
There is also uh, the new things of advanced techniques, which is um, which open a very big window for research opportunities in pediatric population and even in adults, because you have to keep abreast with these techniques and you have to validate these techniques for the clinical use. So this includes, for example, DTI, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, with fiber tracking, similar to this one, for example. Okay? So this is a patient, unfortunately, who has a recurrent um, metastatic hemorrhagic neuroblastoma to the brain. Brain. And you can see a big lesion here, and unfortunately, that the corticospinal tract passes it through that lesion. Okay, we did a perfusion imaging on here too, because you can see the big lesion. Some of this enhancing, some of this hemorrhagic, but you can see that the only uh, viable and well perfused areas are few uh, for side, not the whole thing. Okay. You can do MR spectroscopy. Uh, this is an example of functional MRI to localize the language area in this uh, ba patient with uh, GPM on the other side. So luckily, the, most of the language area was on the other side. So the, this is um, to expect if there is any going to be any language deficit for surgery. We also do uh, liver imaging uh, with MRI for iron quantification to avoid uh, biopsy for these kids. This is another tumor here, classical one, adjacent to the septum. We did segmentation of the lesion. Uh, we did the 3G reconstruction. We measured the volume of the lesion and we color it and fuse it with these images for a better presentation and easy of um, visualization for my, our colleagues. This is another patient that has a recurrent uh, lesion here close to the optic tract. So with DTI, you can see a nice lift optic tract. And you can see the right is thinned here and severed here, unfortunately. The good thing that the corticospinal tract were severed from this region. Recently, there is a lot of talk and involvement about the AI, the artificial intelligence in radiology practice and radiology research. And uh, these are examples from the literature, but currently we are exploring the opportunity of deep learning and cranial ultrasound for our patients' population. So this is a very rich area for future research products. We also could public uh, um, uh, report uh, or public book uh, chapters, publish in book chapters. So what resources are available for you, for you as a trainee? Uh, we have lots of opportunities, right? So you can apply as a summer student, you can apply to research in medicine, uh, students. Uh, your role in these studies um, varies according to your availability, your time, commitment, and the scope that you're willing to do in this research. It could be a mini project. You can just involve like reports or um, um, work on case series or case reports. You can be more involved as a research assistant, for example, do more data collection. Um, you could be involved in analysis, maybe in communication with the patients, especially in the prospective studies for the consent, for the different scripts, for um, answering any of those questions. You don't have to be uh, well knowledgeable and uh, mastering the, the topic of the research that you're going to be involved with, but you should be enthusiastic and eager to know and to participate. And you should gauge your time and availability and choose the research project project that means to you. OK, uh, there are lots of grants and funding opportunities available for students. There are national, international and local grants uh, for our department. For example, we have the David Fraser Radiology Research Foundation grants. Some of them include the summer students grants and you can apply to others if you have a mentor from the department too. But the RSNE is a very rich uh, resource for students and for supporting their education. Other initiative we did and um, uh, resources that could be available to you too is our research course. We did this in 2019 as an introduction to research in pediatric radiology. We talked about REP approval, what you need to do with that. We talked about our partners, Biotech Lab, and research design and methodology. Uh, and then uh, there is another initiative, which is the research pitch that um, similar to the three minute thesis, that each staff present uh, three slides about their open research project. Uh, so the, the trainee will attend like an hour session. They will listen to these um, research projects and see 
what is it about? What is the, is, uh, the, the trainee involvement in those? And if you are interested, you can contact that um, uh, staff and then discuss the details of that research project. We usually held it in February and September. And we also have our research day that uh, our trainees, departments, RATS, staff present their research work in me, and we usually have a guest speaker. Biotech is a very good um, hospital-based medical imaging research center that you should be aware of. It is part, it's affiliated with Dalhousie and located within IWK and HI. They run a, a research heavily environment. They usually have opportunities for uh, trainees uh, to be involved at different level in their research projects. So in summary, we are available to help. We are we look to help um, graduate and undergrads and high school students who are involved in research and willing to participate in radiology and scholarship. Um, feel free to contact us. Uh, you can email me. You can email Vanessa Ross, uh, our pediatric radiology education and research assistant. And thanks for listening. I hope you will. Um, have a good day and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you again.